Intellectuality, a program where we explore issues related to education and educational theory within our world today. We are produced in conjunction with the Philosophy of Education Society of Australasia and their new digital venture, Pisa Agora, and the journal Educational Philosophy and Theory. I am Amy Soho, a PhD candidate in Educational Foundations at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And we have Alex here. Yeah, I'm Alex Means. I'm the graduate chair and associate professor uh, in the Department of Educational Foundations at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And today we're super excited. We're joined by our guest, Dr. Nicole Nguyen, an associate professor of Social Foundations of Education at University of Illinois, Chicago. Through ethnography, her research critically examines national security issues, war, militarization, and U.S. schools. She has two books out, both on University of Minnesota Press, A Curriculum of Fear, Homeland Security, and U.S. Public Schools, which received the 2017 Globe Book Award from the American Association of Geographers, and most recently, her 2019 book, Suspect Communities, Anti-Muslim Racism and the Domestic War on Terror. Welcome, Nicole, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Uh, so, Nicole, we're really excited to have you with us today. We want to begin by talking about your, your first book, uh, A Curriculum of Fear. And this is an ethnographic study of a homeland security program in a struggling public high school. Um, and you call this Milton High School. Uh, could you talk a bit about the origins of this homeland security program? how it started, how it works, the kinds of social relations it produces at the school level, and also what it tells us about the broader militarization of US society uh, and our educational system. Yeah, sure. Um, so Milton High School at the time was a struggling public high school that had gone through several school reform iterations, changing curriculum, changing policy, and part of the district's response was to give each high school in the district its own identity, its own thematic program that leveraged industry, nearby industries. And so the idea with Milton was there's poor and working class, of, uh, poor and working class kids of color who are struggling. The school is notorious for having fights, um, low academic achievements, um, but also located in the greater DC area. So there's all these security industry agencies. Uh, there's a lot of security money essentially in the region. And so the idea was how do we leverage uh, those resources to serve who our students are. And so the idea was to, that the theme that Milton would adopt was this Homeland Security Program. And the idea was through these partnerships, they could train poor and working class youth of color for low level work uh, in the security industry. And to be honest, you know, it, it draws on the things that make good schools, right? So it created a sense of community. Students had a sense of identity and ownership over their school. There were teachers who really cared about them and checked in on them. Um, the community's perceptions of the school and of the students changed to become more positive. So you did actually see a lot of positive things that, that happened through this program. And it, and it sort of engaged you know, the best practices of education. Uh, but of course, it was all arced through this national security and, and terrorism lens. And so one of the, the questions that I was exploring through the, through the ethnography was, what does it mean that kids learn to interpret the world in which they live through this terrorism lens? Um, and, you know, young people would say, I get on the bus and I scan the bus to look for terrorist threats. You know, I, I'm driving in my community and I'm looking for suspicious activity, right? And so to think about how young people came to adopt um, this terrorist lens, drew on national security ideologies and discourses to make sense of the world in which they lived, and then to buy into these national security solutions. So these are kids of color right, um, poor and working class kids of color um, who are he already heavily policed and um, had been heavily policed in their schools who then come to see policing and war as the solution to social problems. So the, the, th the very things that are targeting them, they come to buy into. Um, and I think the last thing I'll say is that even though young people had all of these aspirations of becoming NSA spies, of becoming Northrop Grumman uh, weapons engineers, 
teachers themselves would say, oh, these kids are never going to do that. Like they're going to be like some kind of low level, um, you know, they'll be the janitor at the NSA. But even if you're a janitor in the NSA, you have a security clearance, so you might make some more money. So there was a misalignment of what was being sold to kids and what adults in the school actually thought was achievable for these young people. So the book tries to explore all of those contours. So who who were the adults? Um, did they, were these were these teachers that just um, were this? How how did the interface between the curriculum, the curriculum development, and those who implemented the curriculum work? And then also, could you give us some examples of? the way the curriculum circulated throughout the culture of the school, the school day, and maybe some, some examples of how that curriculum reinforced those sort of contradictory, uh, those contradictions within the, the, the ideological um, milieu of this, of this project. So part of how the curriculum was created was that teachers would actually sit down. So, so there, I should say that the Homeland Security program was a program within a school. So it's something that students signed up for much like you might sign up for an IB program or a magnet program. So you have to sign, you know, you have to sign up for the program. Um, and it's not your whole day is at Homeland Security. You take Homeland Security classes and you also take math, science, uh, English classes. Um, so what teachers would do, both Homeland Security teachers and su regular subject area teachers, is that they would sit down with national security industry folks, right? They would get an engineer from Northrop Grumman, and the mathematics teacher would say, what kind of mathematics are important? How do you apply mathematics in your daily work? And they would then say, okay, well, to, you know, to build a bomb, you need to do X, Y, and Z. Here's the kind of mathematics you need. And then the teacher would you know, incorporate that into our curriculum. So one of, one of the examples is, um, the math teacher used to give this example of, you know, Jim would throw a ball and there's some, you know, trajectory that you have to calculate, right, the arc of the ball. And so in talking with these national security experts, she changed that. So then it's uh, a sniper is trying to shoot and hit a target in North Korea. And so the idea is how do, how do I calculate the trajectory, the angles and all that needed mathematically to hit a target in North Korea. So in some ways it's these very small changes, right? Um, that sort of seep their way into young people's minds so that they're constantly thinking about national security. And another way they did this was they would start in kindergarten and they would show up in kindergarten and say, um, you know, here, here's what a fire truck is. And, and then, you know, later they would say, you know, two fire trucks leave the fire engine, that firehouse at this time going different miles per hour, who's going to get there first, right? So they were building these layers so that it was almost impossible to see outside of this national security lens so that young people are always applying subject matter to the, the problem of terrorism um, in the United States. So in some ways what they're doing is really innovative, right? They're trying to, to, trying to make education relevant to kids, but the way that it's being made relevant is through national security, through war, um, and through terrorism. Um, but it was, you know, high, highly successful um, through these through these collaborations, I know you had some more questions for me, but I've I've forgotten them. Oh no no that's no that's that's great that's that's um that's that's great. And when you say highly successful, do you mean successful uh, under the terms set by the the goals and aims of the program itself, um, or successful in reshaping the worldview as a kind of world making project within the school? I, uh, both, because that's part, part of the goal of the program is this sort of world making um, project of, you know, we can train the next generation of national security agents. And that's not just with the tools of the trade. It's also you have to have a certain ideological mindset. You have to actually believe there's a terrorist threat, that this is what constitutes the terrorist threat and here's the proper solutions for that terrorist threat. And so it was sort of through this hands-on curriculum that students bought into it because they were engaged, they went on lots of field trips. So they bought into the program itself and because they're bought into the program, then they just buy into, they were buying into the curriculum itself. Um, and so they wanted to, they wanted to be experts um, of this curriculum. So what about after too? Oh, I'm 
I'm just asking, wondering, like, after students have matriculated through the program, like, what were, the, I guess, the, um, the effects of that? Or did they still buy into it even after going through the program? Yeah, I shouldn't say it's totalizing because, you know, there are some kids who it just fit their schedule. So they did the Homeland Security program. So they, they didn't participate. But yes, they as they were moving through the program, they would they would talk about how um, they were, you know, they encountered, oh, my neighbors had these big drum, these big barrels um, outside of their houses. And so I called the police because I, you know, I thought it was some kind of national security risk. So they, they adopt those, those mindsets in their daily work and they actually act on them. It's not just that they're thinking about it. It's that they then are, in, they're scanning spaces for these terrorist threats and then taking action if they think there's some kind of threat um, in their midst. So uh, people always ask, did anyone reject this curriculum? And the answer is no. I, the only way kids rejected it was, you know, like they fell asleep in class because they didn't want to be there, but that was just like, they didn't want to be in school in general. It wasn't the, the specificity of the content that they were rejecting. It was, they were rejecting school itself. Um, so there, there was a lot of buy-in from the community and from the students. What kind of um, challenges did this, did the, the specificities of this context and this curriculum pose to the ethnography and, and the practice of ethnography? Um, and what kinds of frameworks did you you use in your in your work um, to analyze, uh, you know, these these sort of lived realities, these these forms of representation and understanding that that you found there? So going into this project, uh, going into my field work, I was thinking, this is a story about neoliberal school reform, and that this is about. Um, participating in the gentrification of nearby communities, of making school, certain schools palatable to white, white middle-class families relocating for these security industry jobs. So to be honest, when I, when I was going into the school, I didn't really think, you know, I've seen school reform projects come and go. I've seen curriculum come and go. And I wasn't anticipating that it would be as sophisticated and bought into as it, as it was. And so I honestly thought neoliberalism is going to be the lens through which I understand what's happening, these school choice, school reform projects. Um, that's what I'm going to be seeing and, and what kinds of school choice options are made available to poor and working class kids of color. That's what I thought the story was going to be. And as an ethnographer, that's what I was preparing to hear and to, to observe. And I do remember at my time, this is my dissertation work, um, my advisor had said, I think you're really going to struggle with hmm. hearing things you disagree with. And I, I wasn't expecting it. I didn't take her, her warning seriously. And I got to the school and neoliberalism tells part of the story, but I, I came to realize nationalism, militarism, national security, uh, were actually more dominant themes uh, and frames of analyses I needed to engage than I thought. Um, and it was a school reform project, but it turned out middle-class families never went to the school. Like they bought houses and the school redistricted to protect white middle-class families from ever going to Milton. And so that this was actually for kids of color and it, was, it stayed a program for kids of color. And that the real story was how do you mobilize nationalism concepts of citizenship and militarism to create a, a school reform project that's about getting kids of color to behave, to be disciplined, to buy into um, the, the social formations that criminalize and dehumanize them. And how do we maybe get some low wage workers into the security industry? So that, that became the story more than neoliberal school reform became the story. And so I had to think more seriously, like what is nationalism? How is it being mobilized? How does it articulate with specific notions of what it means to be a so-called good citizen um, at the school? How did young people sort of negotiate those different identities and concepts in their daily lives? Um, just one quick follow-up to that. So did the need for you to shift to these other um, conceptual um, frameworks such as nationalism, national security, et cetera, et cetera, did they then enhance and expand your understanding of schooling in a neoliberal society in any specific ways? Or did the framework of neoliberalism itself just 
just sort of become inoperable. I mean, what did did this? Did uh, yeah. Yeah, no, neoliberalism was certainly still there, but I couldn't, you know, I think when we talk about globalization and racial capitalism, we, we sometimes talk about it as distinct from or, or independent of um, empire war making and militarism. And the project really put front and center, you know, that they're interdependent uh, formations that we actually have to think about these social forces in more complex and nuanced ways that they're not sort of existing in a vacuum. So the the program probably couldn't have existed without neoliberal school reform policies happening in the district. Like the, the fact that that was a thing and had been a thing in the district was a part of how it was made possible as a, as a, as a, program, um, but that we can't understand neoliberal school reform without also thinking about militarism and empire um, and things like that. And now that I'm in, in Chicago, you know, that has a lot of military programs, a lot of military academies, you can see how we can't think about neoliberal school reform without also thinking about militarization and securitization. So it was more about, you know, pushing my understanding of neoliberalism and its articulation with, with other social formations um, through the process. And of course, it raised um, all sorts of ethical issues of what do you do as an ethnographer when you're observing all of these horrifying things and just going along with it and pretending like you agree with um, what you're seeing. And you know, then what does it mean to write a book about you know, all of these issues that got raised uh, through the school day? Yeah, and actually, I think when you're bringing that up, I like how you said that you have to recognize the interdependence, like all the different complex relationships, and building outward from a curriculum of fear. One of the really, one of the many interesting facets of your work is that is its attention to geopolitics and seeing how that all connects, and it's a sophisticated untangling of the different complex connections of like power, security, education, politics, neoliberalism, militarization, oh gosh, increasing national nationalism. Um, can you talk about your approach to geopolitics? Because you kind of do it in a, in a different way and how that helps inform your um, analysis. Yeah, so part of, you know, I think a lot of times we think about schools as sites where certain social forces shape what's going on, that schools are sort of these downstream, if you think about gentrification, like they're these downstream sites that are affected by broader social processes. And the Homeland Security School really forces us to say, sure, geopolitics, uh, geopolitical struggles shape what goes on in schools, but schools actually participate in the making of geopolitics, that, that the state often mobilizes the school to contribute to its geopolitical agenda. And that could be the global war on terror. It could be, you know, nationalism uh, within the United States. Um, but that schools actually are affected by and affect these, these broader geopolitical agendas. Um, so we want to, we want to transition into how this, this work then informs and and has shaped your your current book project your new book suspect communities so this is the first major qualitative study of countering violent extremism or the u.s government's uh countering violent extremism program cve um, it's arisen in major cities in the united states since 2011. could you talk about a talk a bit a bit about what drew you to this project Give us some background on the CVE program itself and how you approach your study of it. Sure. So as I was finishing up um, a curriculum of fear, the FBI released a uh, online portal, this online module for high school kids. It wanted to mandate that all high school kids had to participate in this module, and it was called Don't Be a Puppet. And Don't Be a Puppet essentially is trying to teach kids not to become terrorists. And it got a lot of pushback from the American Federation of Teachers, of Muslim advocacy groups for you know, chilling, political dissent, political discussion in class, sort of the free exchange of ideas. Um, the idea was that um, this, this focus on terrorism would criminalize kids for you know, internet searches, for trying to do research on specific topics. Um, and so 
I really wanted to know more about why the FBI was trying to insert itself into, you know, some kind of national uh, curriculum uh, agenda and what it was trying to achieve by mobilizing schools to participate for, you know, to get all kids basically to have to take this module to graduate from, from high school. And so don't be a puppet that online module is actually a part of the broader uh, Obama administration's countering violent extremism framework. And so countering violent extremism or CVE um, is framed as this progressive alternative to the domestic war on terror. So instead of doing sting operations, instead of infiltrating mosques, the idea is that we can mobilize community members, we can mobilize teachers and guidance counselors and mental health professionals to, through the course of their daily work, identify people who they think are future terrorists. So the idea is that teachers would uh, both use their classroom to identify young people who might be vulnerable to becoming terrorists and also use their classroom to teach kids not to become terrorists. Um, and so that, that was really the, the connecting piece between the first project and the second project was, again, schools are being tasked with you know, this, this geopolitical national security agenda, and many schools are taking up this mantle um, as, as being good citizens, that this is what good schools do is, is they part participate um, in these projects. So the, the book was really exploring um, not just schools, but all the different ways countering violent extremism shows up in the United States, actually from the perspectives of national security practitioners themselves. So to understand what kinds of narratives and discourses do they engage, uh, so they themselves buy into it, but also so they can convince communities to police and survey themselves in the name of, of national security. Yeah, and I think you, again, talking about like, how the construction of a good citizen, right? That, that identity and how that becomes um, created throughout, through schools. Could you also then discuss the um, contemporary roots of Islamophobia and the anti-Muslim sentiment in the US and how it became articulated and reinforced through that CVE program? Yeah, so one of the things I try to do in the book project is to, to do this reframing of Islamophobia as anti-Muslim racism to, to get away from the idea that Islamophobia is some kind of individualized fear, to think through how um, anti-Muslim racism is actually baked into institutions and policies um, in ways that um, harm and criminalize and dispossess um, Muslim communities in the United States since, you know, the arrival of um, African Muslims in the United States um, during slavery. So part of part of this book is trying to it, trying to think through how is anti-Muslim racism institutionalized through national security policies, and who's who's called on to do the daily work uh, of anti-Muslim policing, anti-Muslim surveillance, and essentially anti-Muslim racism. And and so we see how that's actualized through these policies that are calling on teachers to identify people who they think are, are terrorists, because it's invariably Muslim or people who they think are Muslim um, who, who, are, who are targeted um, as potential terrorists. You're not seeing white Christian kids um, who are you know, th you know, threatening to shoot up a school. They're not thought of as terrorists. They're not preemptively um, criminalized as future terrorists, but that, that one way um, anti-Muslim racism um, gets institutionalized is through national security, national security policy. And you spend, you spend some time talking about the gender dynamics of anti-Muslim racism. And I, I found that quite interesting and important. Could you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, I think there's a, the over-representation of the, the idea of the sort of brown male menace, right? The, the, the terrorist um, who is both Muslim and male. And so um, Muslim men are, and boys are more likely to be identified and targeted as future terrorists. Although uh, women who, who cover are also seen as the most extreme forms of Islam, even though that's, that's not true. And, and how um, the hijab becomes a, a, a political marker, right? Not just a religious marker, but it, it somehow signifies conservatism, um, barbarism, like all these racialized narratives. Um, 
that, that get mapped onto them. But most often Muslim women are, and girls are positioned as supporters of terrorists. We can think about Omar Mateen's wife being prosecuted um, for her alleged support um, of her, her husband's actions. Um, and so, yeah, women are often seen as supporters and because they're seen as supporters, the, they are then, Muslim women are then called on to be the ones who prevent future terrorist attacks. So they're the ones who should teach their children not to become terrorists. They're the ones who should monitor their homes and their mosques and their community centers for potential terrorists. So th this, there's a responsabilization that happens within Muslim communities that um, unevenly falls on Muslim women um, in a way that it doesn't fall on Muslim men because Muslim men are preconceived as the terrorist threat, as where the terrorist threat um, comes from. Mm -hmm. And how do those dynamics then map onto the sort of broader racial economy of U.S. society in relation to who gets defined as a terrorist and who doesn't? Yeah, so I think the what we see is this growing concern around terrorism gets further weaponized against communities of color. So we can think about um, the, stand, the water protectors at Standing Rock. Um, they were not only seen at portrayed as terrorists, they were portrayed as jihadists, uh, specific, like Shia uh, female fighters, that's how, how they were termed, right? So they're, they're indigenous water protectors who are now being framed as Islamic extremists. Um, and through that marker, the federal government said, we're now justified um, to implement these, these war tools um, to disrupt um, and discredit the, the water protectors. And, you know, there is also this language that uh, there's this jihadist bleed out model that was applied to the water protectors. So the idea was the water protectors are here and they're just going to go somewhere else, just like people in Bosnia went somewhere else um, to go fight. And so we need to lock people up. We need to criminalize people so they don't start a riot and a protest and an uprising somewhere else. So you can see how the logics, uh, like global war on terror logics, then seep into and articulate with domestic policing policies. You can think about this about the category of black identity extremists, um, that, that is another terror category that was used to justify, I think it was called Operation Iron Fist, to disrupt um, black political organizers. So we see how um, the, the widening of the domestic war on terror is not just about criminalizing and brutalizing Muslim communities, but it then is used to reinforce other kinds of racial hierarchies um, and other brutal practices. So we already know that the police are, are killing black people in the streets, and this becomes yet another wedge to justify that, that brutality. Mm -hmm. And this, this speaks um, a little bit to some of the contradictions that are embedded within liberal security frameworks. And there's a ton of really interesting literature in um, international relations on liberal security. And I'm sure you're well familiar with that. Um, and you point out that the CVE program is, is it's, it's public facing representational um, schema is one of, of sort of learning, listening, and helping, you know, communities, but yet um, its symbolic and material effects are reinforcing uh, historical and contemporary patterns of racial profiling and systemic racism. Could you talk a little bit about those contradictions in liberal, like, how do you understand liberal security um, as a kind of uh, governmental formation or form of governmentality in relation to this specific program that you talked about or, or analyzed? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's sort of, uh, that kind of security formation is sort of swimming in the neoliberal multiculturalism, the politics of representation. You know, indigenous scholars have been, you know, really questioning the idea of representation. Um, so I think one of the, you know, one of my struggles with this project was understanding how Muslim communities have been over-policed and over-criminalized, and that they're, that they're, there is an effort to make the security state less harmful. And so there is a buying in of, you know, one of the most common uh, metaphors people told me throughout my field work was, um, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And so we want to at least be at the table, right? Like we, we at least want to have a, have some kind of say. I'm and sorry, Nicole, I hate to interrupt you, but what did they mean by menu? I just, that, uh, 
you're, you'll be eaten. Like you, you, you <laughs> yeah. Like uh, it's funny because everyone said it, and I, and I came to think it was a, a common phrase. Um, that yeah. So the idea is that they they would rather they know at the end of the day they're going to be criminalized, and is this a strategy to minimize? that criminalization. So in some ways I could understand that. Of course, there are other folks who are young people who are saying, um, we're not going to participate in anything that criminalizes us. We can think of a world where we don't need to make, we don't need to hedge in this kind of way. Um, but I think people really bought into that neoliberal multiculturalism, the politics of representation um, as, a, as a progressive reform. And, and Obama sold it as a progressive reform, although CVE is actually the brainchild of, of Bush, who said, in order to be successful in our war making, we need to be more liberal about it. We need to give kids, we need to give Iraqi kids coloring books, and we need to play soccer with them so we can be better at, you know, bombing and droning um, people. Like, we can, we, we can get intelligence through our community relations. And it's the same thing, like, in community policing in the United States, it's sort of draws on that same idea that we can get more intelligence, we can be better at policing if we have relationships with communities. So that's the, the state's perspective is that these relationships help us do our, do our dehumanizing project uh, and securitization of communities better. Whereas communities are thinking, you're coming for us anyway, is this a way to mitigate you're coming for us? That's, that's the liberal sort of narrative. The, the more radical narrative is we don't need the state at all. Like we don't, this is not the game that we want to play. Like we, we want to set the conditions and terms ourselves. The question of terrorism is not relevant to our community. Um, we think you're asking the wrong questions to begin with. Like the things that make us most insecure, participants would say, is economic insecurity, policing, war, brutality. Like these are the things that make us insecure. Um, but sort of the, the the liberal approach to security here was if you participate in the making of national security, it'll be less racist, it'll be less gendered, it'll, you know, it'll be less problematic. Um, and, and you can see how people then get caught, caught in that. You know, teachers are saying, well, it's better than me than a police officer. And the question is, is it really better if it's you as a teacher doing the policing than the police officer? Um, and so I think those are, you know, on the ground, things people really have to grapple with. I think it's a little, it's easier when you're a little distant from, from the problem to, to make those claims about what's effective and what's not effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it seems like too, like when you're talking about the complexity of these relationships, and that's such a thing with, if a teacher, like, oh, it's better if I do this. And you're like, yeah, is it though? Because, I mean, it seems like ethics and um, the politics, it plays a significant role in trying to navigate those like differences of power and access within those relationships. And how did you conceive of these challenges when you're doing the work with, you know, community groups and then doing CVE and talking to the different, I guess, the different actors and participants? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of um, organizers have this concept of sim simultaneity in their heads about how organizations, so Muslim organizations could, can do good things for their community and also participate in these really bad projects. And so how do you do political education in a way that gets organizations not to sign on onto some of these things? And I think that that concept of simultaneity, it's one that I struggle with because if I see an organization, you know, collaborating with the police, for me, I, I've written them off. But the reality of people's lives is they're interfacing with these different community organizations all the time. And so there has to be a strategy for, you know, people would say um, the government's, what the government wants to achieve is to fracture this, the Muslim community. Like th these policing projects are about fracturing community so that you fracture dissidents. And so the idea was how do you strategize in a way that doesn't create the internal war, the internal conflict over who's buying into CBE and who's rejecting CBE? But how do you contest the state for making CVE the thing that's in their community, right? And, and how do you then work with organizations 
who might buy into CVE or might accidentally participate because they don't know what it is, um, how, do you, how do you turn it not towards those community groups, but how do you turn it towards the state? Because the state has created the crisis. The state has created the, the terms in which people are participating. And so I think that that, you know, that strategy is, is really important to think about. And I think it's also really hard when you want to do a direct action and it's, it's for somebody to reject money. Um, you're not going to do a direct action against the Department of Homeland Security. It's going to be against community organization. So I think there is that constant um, who is our target? Why are we targeting them? Um, and what is it that, what is the big thing that we're actually, what kind of world are we fighting for um, that I think was important? And that concept of simultaneity was important because it recognizes that the enemy is not each other, the enemy is actually the state. And it's the state the state is invested in the internal fighting. You, uh, you wrote an article recently uh, for, for uh, an academic journal where you talk about this concept of studying up in relation to activist research, the kind of research that you do. So could you talk a little bit about that concept in relation to simultaneity as, as you're framing it and also um, how it relates to the, the, the sort of theoretical, epistemological, methodological, and political dynamics of, of, of what you do in your work? Yeah, I think uh, in that article, I talk about how through my training within educational policy studies that I was taught that the gold standard of activist research is youth participatory action research. Um, you know, I, I admire the work of, of folks like Michelle Fine, where young people, um, are mobilizing and, and that mobilization is at the center of their research and trying to try to figure out how um, academics and the university can support young people in conducting research that supports social movement work. And when I started this project, um, I approached a, 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 a community organization to ask, you know, hey, do you want to do a, you know, a PAR project on countering violent extremism and other anti-Muslim policies? And the organization said, like, look, we've got that covered. Like our young people are studying, they understand racial profiling, they understand these policies. Um, we, we actually don't need you to do that. Um, what we need you to do is, you know, you're, you're an academic, you can fly places, people take you seriously. We need you to actually figure out what are the national security policies that are affecting our communities. Like go talk to these people. What are they saying? What are they trying to achieve? What kinds of narratives are they talking about? And so it was sort of through that, that, I mean, very humbling moment of like the thing that I think I have to offer, I don't actually have, I don't really have anything to offer this community group. Right. Um, but they're saying like your privileged position allows you to do some things that we can't do. And so we need you to go do that. And so that's when I began thinking about, studying up as actually supporting grassroots organizing from below because the idea was that I would go do all of this research and then report back to communities what I learned. Um, you know, how are these programs being funded? Who's funding them? Where are they? Who are the key actors? What are the discourses used to justify them? Um, like all of that they couldn't get access to because they, could, they can't get a meeting with DHS, right? They're not going to be taken seriously by state agencies. Uh, or they can't just randomly fly places um, to do this work. And so I began seeing how that work uh, of studying people in positions of power could actually um, serve really well communities who could then act on them in their own way. So for me, I'm, I was more of the intermediary of, here's the information I've learned, I'm gonna give it to you, and then you know, you, you can act on it how you want to, to act on it, um, and then I can do whatever additional research um, you need. So that's, that's where I began to see that activist research actually could be not just participatory action research. There's all these different methods um, and tools and approaches we can use to support social movement work. Um, and that we actually do have to be creative um, for thinking about how to organize against state violence. Yeah. And I remember too, in that article, you talk about they're significant, even though, you know, you have this like privilege, right, as an academic, um, you encountered like significant challenges from doing the study. <laughs> um, but related to that, what do you see more largely to as the role of academics and intellectuals and ethnographers, you know, especially in terms of responsibility and aiding this social change? Yeah, I think especially, you know, 
for this project, I felt um, accountable to Muslim and Arab organizations who were the targets um, of this work. And so part of part of thinking through like, what do I write was also a conversation. So there's one question around what do I research? What kind of research is useful for the work that these communities want to do? Um, but another question is like, what kind of academic projects are actually useful? Um, and you know, part of what communities are pushing back against is a cottage industry of not uh, uh, of terrorism studies, of this production of knowledge that says they are terrorists and they are the biggest terrorist threat um, in the world. So how do you produce knowledge? How do you produce academic scholarship that challenges that, that they then can cite and use um, in their own work? Um, and so part of that has been writing academic studies, but it's also been about writing community reports. So translating those academic articles into these accessible reports that you know identify who who's doing the criminalization, like which agencies, you know, who's at the agencies, where is the money coming from? Um, so that that has that kind of production, what I write, has been in conversation with communities for thinking about what kinds of, I mean, the book project itself was um, write it as fast as you can so we can start citing it, um, that we can start saying, look, there is this person who has a PhD um, who wrote a credible book um, that delegitimizes this national security policy. So that's always been in conversation and, and um, because at the end of the day, I feel like who I'm accountable to are these community organizations and community groups. Um, and that, and so I can't just write whatever I want for the purposes of, of my own, own career. It actually has to be in conversation with the needs uh, of community groups. Um, so this question is a little bit, we're, we're, we're nearing the end. This question is a little bit of a departure, but we'd, we'd, we'd like to hear your thoughts about kind of where we are at this moment in time uh, in relation to the work that you do. And I think that everyone right now would like to return to normalcy. You know, we've been experiencing this pandemic um, and all of the attendant social conflicts and instabilities that have kind of erupted over 2020. There's this desire to return to normalcy, but unfortunately, a return to normalcy is a kind of return to a business as usual that's been responsible for the devastation of the kind of communities that you uh, work with over the last four decades. Um, so the, our question to you is, how might we learn to let go of like forms of denial and attachments to this dead-end sense of normalcy? Call it like neoliberal normalcy if you want to. Um, and work to imagine and create a world that is uh, more just and sustainable and democratic? And where do you draw inspiration to continue doing this work um, in the service of that project? Yeah, I think for the last four years, I feel like I've been saying, as well as other folks have been saying, that we can't exceptionalize the Trump administration, that Trump is the culmination of a lot of different um, projects um, that sort of cohered and coalesced um, in, in a particular historical moment. And that, you know, just rolling back to four years ago, you know, was life actually great? I mean, we were droning people, we were, you know, brutalizing people, like this is not actually a, a, a stark departure, which is not to say that things were not worse and more intense for people over the last four years, that's to say that. Um, but of course, there's great skepticism, uh, within Muslim communities about this return to to a Biden Obama kind of kind of era, um, which was quite brutal and quite awful um, for folks. So yeah, I, th I think continuing to de exceptionalize the Trump administration and and that um, we don't get here uh, without sort of the the entrenchment of what already was here, um, and that this is just a more visible expression of. Um, you know this this painful legacy um, that just plays out differently um, from from decade to decade. So I think that's important. I just I, I you know I think I think people kind of get it, but I think there's this like real sense of relief people have this misplaced sense of uh, of relief. So I think yeah, continuing to push um, that that it's business as usual is not is not a great way way to go. And I think. You know, I think the uprisings over the summer, um, the continued, you know, here in Chicago, there's just such a continued push, um, you know, for imagining a world without uh, prisons, 
um, and police that there are such strong political education campaigns that are, are being launched by young people to, to politicize their communities. So I think that's where I take I take inspiration from. Um, in Chicago, there's uh, so much um, uh, solidarity across social movements that I that I think is necessary um, at this time. That I that I think the summer kind of revealed like we can't just be against uh, anti-black violence. That that um, that that understanding of anti-blackness has to be connected to our understanding of um, you know anti-immigrant racism, anti-Muslim racism, and so I think that's. The possibility of the moment is all of those bridges that were that were made um, through the the horrors of the Trump presidency, right? Like he was showing all of the different ways these struggles are interconnected, and you know we can't fight for one without fighting for the other. And so I think that is part of the the hopeful moment of what comes for me, what comes out of the Trump administration was all this great political work, um, sort of sort of building um, off of each other and, and supporting one another. Um, in the process. Oh, wonderful. Um, I've, I've enjoyed this uh, conversation with you so much. Thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your work. Um, and we hope to maybe have you back on again at some point. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was, this was a great conversation. Appreciate it.